you check out a shop called beast.com. We have a blender library there that has step-by-step -step instructions for if you are brand new. We also have a link to the YouTube Blender Beast playlist where this session along with the previous seven sessions that we've done are already recorded. So you can watch at your own pace. You can rewatch if you're not in front of a computer right now, you can do it later and follow along then. But once again, that is a shop called Beast. I'll put it in the chat here, beast.com. Make sure you bookmark that. Uh, and yeah, Lost, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to you. Could you start us off with just like a little background, like when you got started with Blender and then it's, it's all you? Yeah, sure, no, no problem. Um, yeah, I hope everyone, everyone can sort of hear me and see the screen all right. Um, yeah, what's, uh, what's my background? Uh, good question. Uh, so yeah, I probably started picking up Blender um, maybe around, more seriously around April. Um, sort of dabbled with it a bit before. Um, I work in a creative job anyway, so I have some exposure to, um, you know, different, different modeling softwares and, and different, uh, visualization softwares. Um, so I'm no kind of stranger to like the 3d world, but, uh, yeah, probably made more of a concerted effort to, uh, kick off learning Blender probably around April. Um, you know, saw what the Keep Call Beast, uh, community was putting out, thought it was really interesting. Um, thought it was super cool that everyone was kind of jumping onto 3D, you know, learning, uh, kind of learning together. And uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of the project anyway, huge fan of the characters. I think they're just this, uh, you know, super cool blend of something that's uh, really approachable to, you know, lots of different people. Uh, so yeah, it kind of inspired me a little bit to sort of jump in and, and get started. So um, yeah, hopefully that's <laughs> enough. Uh, kind of background about me and we can just kind of get into it but it kind of looks like we've got um we've got a few kind of different mixtures of skill sets in the chat um so i'm kind of keen for this tutorial today to um cover some of the basics you know go from the basics and then um towards the end maybe we dip into some slightly more advanced things although still not kind of you know super advanced uh, so anyone that's like a sort of <laughs> Six or above, like you probably got this um, already. But yeah, uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. I just thought we'd um, start with uh, a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna sort of go over today and what we're gonna cover. So we're gonna try and make a scene uh, similar to what you see on the screen at the moment. Um, so just a simple, uh, relatively kind of moody, dramatic lighting setup for your beast. Um, you know, we're gonna go through uh, some of the different options uh, and different ways that you can light things in Blender. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of them. Some of the different types of lights and objects that you can add and, and um, you know, the changes and differences between them. And then after that, we're going to sort of build, uh, build a simple lighting scene uh, with your GLB, uh, GLB file. So um, don't worry if you don't have like an FBX and you haven't been kind of animating your beast or waiting on your typos. You can just use the standard, um, the standard file from the from the um, Kikopi Studio Hub. So hopefully everyone can kind of then follow along, even if they don't have typos. Um, I will be using cycles for this uh, for the tutorial, but most of this will also work in Eevee. Um, except for like a couple of things, a couple of other things towards the end, which are slightly more advanced. Um, and the only differences being with EV is, um, you know, you might have to change a few values, um, because the way cycles and EVs work, EV works is they calculate light quite differently. So whatever works for one might not work necessarily for the other. Uh, though I did kind of test this back and forwards uh, a few times. So hopefully it's not, hopefully they're not too different from each other. So. Um, for all of you folks that have been struggling to render stuff on on cycles on your laptops, um, EV should be a relatively good option until probably towards the end of this tutorial. So, you know, after we set up the basic scene, we'll add a couple of lights, uh, we'll go through some volumetrics, so maybe adding some fog into the scene. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll dive into some aspects of the node editors, so the shader editors, um, for a little bit more of a kind of intermediate or advanced uh, part towards the end. So hopefully 
uh, that kind of makes sense before we kind of dive in. Uh, if there's any questions um, that you guys have, like as we go through this, um, hopefully I'm not going like too quickly. Uh, I'll try and remember to sort of shout out uh, all the keys and, and where I'm going and what I'm doing. Um, but I can't promise I'll uh, shout out everything. But if there's no questions like before we before we start, then I'll just go straight into it. Yeah, I'll just say for anyone, if this is your first time attending one of these, if you're getting just started in Blender, if there's some things that are confusing, don't worry, they are covered in the previous tutorials. Each week, we're kind of building off of those basic skills. Um, so if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and keep in mind, this is recorded. And there's a bunch of other tutorials that will uh, catch you up to speed if you're new. Thanks, Lars. Yeah, perfect. I mean, hopefully it should be it should be relatively straightforward to follow along with this one. Um, and hopefully it's not too confusing uh, in the end. But yeah, any questions as we go along, just drop them in the chat. We'll try and answer them. Uh, you know, if I can't answer it, um, you know, maybe maybe Red or Panda or some of the other guys in the chat can. can. Or if we really can't answer it, then, you know, just drop us, uh, drop us a DM on Twitter. Or drop me a DM on Twitter and I'll try to find the answer for you. So, um... Yeah, let's dive into it. So this is what we're going to aim, shoot for, uh, to create today. Uh, hopefully it takes more or less the hour, uh, though I've not timed it, so uh, this should be a good test. And for now, we'll just start from a completely new file. Um, so we're starting from, from nothing and building, uh, you know, building from there. So uh, when you create a new file, it obviously dumps you into this scene if your Blender settings are default. So you'll have a camera, you'll have light, and you'll have cube in the middle, and we don't need any of this. So we can select them all, press X, and delete them. So we've got a completely blank scene. And I'll now just import, I think you probably won't be able to see this, um, if I'm correct, once I'm in the, the menu, but import, and then I'm going to import my um, GLB file from the Kickleby's studio. And hopefully this is the right one. Yep, there we go. So we've got my character in the scene, and we'll go from here. So we're just going to do a bit of scene setup first. Um, so we're going to add in a floor plane, and then we're going to turn that into a backdrop wrap. So Shift-A will bring up the Add menu. So Shift-A is where you can add uh, literally anything into your scene. We want to go into Mesh, we want to go to Plane, and this will add a plane um, right beneath your beast. If you hit S to scale, you can drag it out and scale it to whatever dimension you feel is appropriate. So now we've got a bit of a floor going on, and we're going to turn it into a, a sort of backdrop ramp. So once we set up a camera, you know, it'd be nice if we had a bit of a wall that we can kind of see behind our character, uh, behind him there. So we're going to tab, so tab into edit mode. You'll know when you're in edit mode because um, all the vertices um, will highlight on the object that you have selected. So select the plane, tab, into edit mode, and you'll be good to go. Once we're in edit mode, there's a couple of different options that we can do. So up here in the top left, you'll have a few different selection options. Um, so the first one being vertices, so you can pick individual corners or any points along your mesh. The second one being edges, so you can pick any edge on your mesh. And the third being um, faces, so you can pick any face. Uh, we've only got one face at the moment, but any face on your mesh. You can also use the hotkeys uh, one, two, and three. So one being vertices, two being edge, and three being face. So if we press two, we'll go into edge mode. We'll grab this back edge. E will extrude it, and then you can drag and extrude wherever you want. But in this case, we want to lock our extrusion upwards. So we want to lock it into the z-axis. So once we've pressed E, we can also press Z, and that will lock it into an axis. We could also press Y, and it would lock it into the Y axis, or for some reason, which won't work, but we could lock it into the X axis if we wanted. So we're going to E and Z and bring it up, just so we've got a bit of a wall behind our character. Next, just to get rid of this kind of sharp edge, we're going to select this middle edge at the back here, and we're going to add a few uh, loop cuts and bevels to it to get it to be a smooth sort of fall off. So control B will add in a bevel. And by default, this will be 
uh, I guess you could call it a chamfer, so it will have two edges to the bevel. But you know, we want it to be a little bit smoother, we want it to be a bit rounder. So if you press up on your mouse wheel, it will start adding loop cuts in, and start smoothing out the bevels. So we'll go to probably, I don't know, maybe three or four, and just click to press enter, and then we're good. So we've got a bit of a ramp. It's still looking a little bit faster, but if we right click our object and we shade smooth, that should fix that problem. So now we've got a bit of a sort of scene, a basic scene going on. Hopefully a lot of you guys are familiar with this. I know there's been some previous tutorials that kind of covered some of this stuff. Another thing that's definitely worth doing or kind of practicing early on is to um, just make sure that your outliner is, a, is more organized. So once you start adding more things into your scene, the outliner is the, the tree. Um, and by default, it's kind of up in the top right hand corner. So over here, it's called the outliner. And this is basically just a list of all the things that are in your scene and the folders or collections that they're put in. So right now we've got a bunch of lost, uh, a bunch of my characters, um, different features, and they're kind of just meandering uh, outside into the main collection. So we just want to group these, just tidy things up a little bit. Good working practices are kind of like, you know, easy to bake in um, from the beginning when you're learning rather than trying to relearn them uh, as you go further along and you've got more experience. It's good to kind of bake in some, some best practice where possible. So we'll select all of um, the character from the GLB, GLB file. We'll press M, so your mouse will have to be in the um, in the main viewport. Press M, that will move all of these objects to a new collection. So we'll press new collection, we'll name it something, so I'll call my lost. Press OK, and most of the items, there's a few stragglers, which we can drag up into lost. So my entire character, if I selected all the objects in this, will be in this one folder. And then the plane, the backdrop ramp that we've created, uh, is its own thing in its own collection. And maybe we call this collection, I don't know, other. <laughs> you know, we can also make other connections for lighting, cameras, you know, different objects in your scene. It's an easy way of kind of organizing everything so nothing gets too chaotic as we go along and start adding more, more things. So now we've kind of got this base set up. I want to just talk a little bit about um, different ways of lighting uh, in Blender. And there's probably like, I mean, there's, there's a number of different ways, but the three main kind of ways are um, the, oh, having a bit of a blank, but uh, are the scene lights. So these would be the physical lights that you add into your scene yourself the scene world, which is kind of Blender's um, default environment. And then HDRIs is probably like the third method of, of lighting things in Blender. Now, if you go up here in your viewport to the top right, where you've got your kind of viewport shading options. So, you know, you've got wireframe. Uh, hopefully my Blender doesn't crash actually. Every time I, <laughs> sometimes if I click wireframe, it just crashes out. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But um, the viewport shading, then there's the sort of material preview shading, which is a little bit more detailed than the viewport shading. And then finally, there's the um, rendered viewport shading over on the right hand side. But the little drop down next to it, if you click it, it's got some different options in it. And if we untick both of these options, so scene lights being anything that you create in the scene, any light that you add into the scene yourself as a physical light will be scene lights. The default Blender world is the scene world. So the default Blender environment is the scene world. And then if we untick both of those options, it will then give us um, this strange looking orb, which is the HDRI option. So HDRIs, for those that don't know, uh, sorry if I'm sort of repeating things that people do know, but um, HDRIs stand for high dynamic range image, which is essentially just a really fancy way of saying it's a really good quality 360 degree spherical image. Um, and these are used quite commonly across like a, a number of different 3D softwares. 
And this is a super quick way of lighting things. Um, you know, there's lots of advantages to it, uh, apart from speed. Um, you can also find lots of free HDRI maps um, of kind of different scenes. So that might be outdoor or indoor, um, specific kind of realistic looking lighting setting, settings. So they have a number of advantages for realism. You know, they'll give you um, maybe more accurate reflections. They'll give you accurate exposure values, things along those lines. Um, right now, I don't tend to use this much um, in Blender. I'll try and light things uh, myself because I'm sort of mainly going for a bit of a stylized look. Uh, in my day job, I use HDRIs uh, a lot just because it's super fast under time pressures. So if you untick both the scene lights and scene world, it will give you this option. If you tick scene world, so scene world is Blender's default um, environment, and you can get to the settings of the scene world over here in the right hand side. It's the kind of red earth looking thing with a sort of slash through it. So the world settings over here, and there's a bunch of options in here um, and we, we won't go into them too much, but a basic one would be setting the color. So, you know, white, black, if you set it to black, there'll be no lights, no light in the scene. If you have none of the other options selected, if you set it to white, it will probably be massively overexposed. There's too much light in the scene. Uh, and you can set different colors, and it will affect the overall scene. Um, within the color, and you can obviously control the strength, so you can blow it out even further, you can make it even darker, one being the default strength, and then the color under here. If you pick any of these dots on the left-hand side, it will give you some kind of uh, more detailed expansion into the things you can do within this box. So if we take the little dot next to color, there's a whole bunch of different uh, inputs and sort of outputs. Uh, and one that can potentially be quite useful and is a sort of like a fourth way of maybe lighting your scene, uh, although it's maybe more like a three and a half way of lighting your scene, is the sky texture. So if you pick sky texture, and I'll just zoom out so you can kind of better see this, but it basically puts in a sky. <laughs> and there'll be a few different options for this. Nishita, I have absolutely no idea what the namings <laughs> naming convention of these things mean. I'm so, so sure some people who are more knowledgeable can fill you in on this one. Um, but you can control a bunch of things, like you can control how high you are in the world, you know, like are you 10,000 meters above sea level, and it will change the lighting scenarios based on realistic values. You know, how much air is there in the scene, like if you were in space and there's no air. Um, or how much dust there is, you know, if you're in a smoggy city, or how much ozone there is, so, you know, how, how blue the scene gets in effect. There are a bunch of different options. Um, and further down towards the bottom, there's, um, you'll see sun position. And you can kind of play around with a bunch of different things in here. You can set coordinates for, you know, specifically where you live and all sorts of things like that. But uh, sometimes it's useful to be able to control time. Um, so controlling the time will kind of control sunset or sunrise and things like that. So that's kind of a sort of like maybe a fourth way to light your scene. But the way we're going to focus today is to look at scene lights. So these are the physical lights that you can add, <laughs> you can add to the scene yourself. And there's a number of different kind of options for those things. So I'll just turn all of my um, scene world settings back to uh, back to the default, or I can just turn them off if I don't want the scene world up here. Let me just remember how to do this before I forget. Mm. So I've also got no, if I set it to any one of these other things, I can't quite remember where color is actually. Where is color? Mm. There's a bunch of options, but I'll just turn it off now. Um, so there are like currently no lights in the scene, so you can't see lost if I'm in rendered view. If I go to viewport view, it'll be back, and we can uh, we can go from there. So in Blender, there are essentially four different types of lights. Um, so if you press Shift A, the Add menu where you add your mesh meshes, you can add lights. It's about half or just under or over halfway down the list. 
And there's four things here that you'll see. So the first one is point light. So right now that's just added it into um, where my 3D cursor was set. And I've just dragged it up here through G and then move. G to grab and move. And I'll go back to uh, rendered view. And point lights are essentially a sphere of light in all direction, in all directions. Um, so you can see it kind of having a little bit of effect there. And if you come down to the right hand side and the little green uh, light bulb um, just above the texture and just below constraints, uh, you'll see a bunch of options for this. So point light, you can also control the type of light that the, that the one you've just added is natively within uh, this menu as well. But point lights, you can change the color, you can change the power. So I'll just up the power a little bit. It's probably too far. <laughs> and you can see that it's radiating light evenly around the sphere or this sort of invisible sphere in all directions. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, in your scene, if you have like a model of a light bulb or you have a model of a floor lamp or whatever it might be, or, you know, you just want to get light into a tricky corner or something just to illuminate something, you know, point lights are a great way of doing that because you can control, you know, very directly how much strength is given to the light at any one moment and they're super straightforward. Um, then the next one along, so I could add in another light through shift A and then add a light, or I could just change it over here. So the next one along is sun. I must admit I don't use sun a huge amount. Um, but basically it sort of does what it says on the tin. So it uniformly illuminates the scene um, as a sun sort of would. So you press R to rotate. And you see the shadows get more extreme. You can um, play with the softness of the shadows and the relative strength of the sun quite easily. I guess I don't use them a huge amount. HDRIs would probably be a slightly easier and better way to um, control the thing. Actually, before I forget, I'm just gonna, I'm currently in EV, but I'll just go into cycles um, uh, just so I don't make any mistakes kind of later on. But so the sun being the second one, uh, spotlights. So you'll be hopefully quite familiar with these. I think these are in the, um, I think three of them or at least two of them are in the default um, sort of blender scene that you get from the team, the AKCB team. So spotlights are great. Um, you know, it's essentially light within a cone. And again, it does what it says on the tin. It's different to a point light. Point light would have light that runs all the way around this kind of origin point over here. The cone is only in effect within the cone itself. Uh, and again, you know, you control the color, you control the power, radius, will control um, essentially the blur amount of the light. So you can see here, if it's set to zero, the boundary is relatively sharp. If we move it up to sort of one meter or so, the boundary is relatively soft. You can also kind of have slightly more granular control of those things um, down here where it says beam shape, under beam shape, there's blend. So blend, if there's no radius, Blend will kind of control um, essentially just the very outside edge. So all the way down to zero will give you a perfect sharp edge, which you may want at points. Blend will just soften the edge off a little bit more without necessarily playing with the radius of the light and the softness of the shadows that it creates over here. And then you can obviously control the spot size. So super large. It's almost almost a point light at this point, and then super small all the way down here. And you'll notice that if it gets super small and it's a super focused beam of light for whatever reason, my current power values you know aren't enough. So this is where you'll kind of have to get a bit creative um, with um, some of the values relative to your scene. Um, it would be difficult for me to kind of give you direct uh, values that will work specifically in your scene. Maybe your model's just a little bit bigger, you know, maybe your, your background and the objects in there are a little bit different. So you'll have to play around with power a little bit yourself to try and find what works. But 
I think the way the Blender, um, don't quote me on this, but I think the way that Blender calculates power is it's kind of done over the area or the total area of the light. So in this instance, I would need to like ramp up the power quite a bit to get it to show. But then if I went back and increased my spot size, it would be probably too bright to be any use. So hopefully, oh no, so that's the third, the third um, type of light object you can add. And then the fourth one is an area light. So an area light, I just scale it up slightly so you can see, an area light is essentially a giant rectangle. <laughs> and then light is created um, off the entire area of the rectangle. So these are great for um, more softbox type lighting. So imagine um, you've got a really bright but completely cloudy day. When the sun's light moves through the clouds, it essentially creates super even lighting and there's very few kind of um, soft shadows everywhere like in, in real life. So this is great for things like that. It would also be great for um, things like windows, window planes, or like the image behind a window if you have a window in your scene or anything kind of like of that effect where you would have some natural illumination from the sky and the sun in the sky itself. But these are great for like really easily kind of adding in um, an amount of light to your scene um, at any point. So those are the four different kind of lighting objects that you can add in yourself, or the four different physical objects that you can you can add. So Shift A, light, it's about halfway down, and there's the four options. Once you have a light in your scene, you can retroactively change it to any type of light that you want. So we'll just start building um, some of the basic lighting setup, um, and hopefully you try and recreate the image that you saw in the beginning, um, though. Uh, I've not quite practiced this in real life, whilst also sort of narrating through it, so hopefully it goes all right. But we're going to start with um, we're going to start with just setting up a few materials onto the backdrop ramp. We're going to then set a um, a camera. So we're going to set up a camera. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about composition. You know, talk about moving the camera around, uh, positioning the camera, maybe a few tips and tricks. Um, for composition and cameras specifically, and then we'll start adding in all the lights. So we'll start with just adding a, a, a basic material to the backdrop ramp. So for now, I'm just gonna go into the material preview mode, maybe just for, for ease. I'm gonna select my backdrop ramp, and there's a number of different ways to sort of add, um, to add materials into Blender. Uh, probably the ones that most people are using, or the the method that most people are using is over in the right hand bar, down to the material sort of uh, shader sphere looking icon, the red one, second one up from the bottom, and then adding a new material in there, and it brings in all your options down here. And this is totally fine, by the way, if you're really comfortable um, using these menus, you don't have to follow along with what I'm about to do, but um, this is just maybe how I prefer to work with materials. So. You may or may not know that all of the windows in Blender, so I've got one, two, three, uh, four windows at the moment in this one screen. So I've got my main viewport here. I've got my outliner in the top right. I've got the, um, you know, all the controls in the sort of bottom right. And then at the moment, I've got um, an animation timeline left over from uh, a, different, <laughs> a different file, a different project. But each of these windows can be changed to be whatever you want. Um, so they're not fixed, and that's essentially all that this does up at the top as well. So where it has these different kind of um, modes that you can enter into, layout, modeling, sculpting, UV editing, texture paint, all it's doing there is essentially changing the type of window and the position and size of it on each screen, or on your screen, sorry. So um, you can change any window to be whatever you want. You can also drag in any windows from wherever you want. So in the corners of any of these windows, you'll notice that your mouse turns into a little crosshair and you can drag and change um, change different windows um, you know, differently depending on 
how you like to work. So I just like to have uh, a window towards the bottom um, that I sometimes use for animation. You know, maybe I'm animating through a camera or um, to be honest, I'm just lazy and don't like clicking up here. But in the top left of any of these windows, there's essentially a little button. And if you pick this button in any of the top left of any of these windows, you've got a whole bunch of options here. Um, we don't need to know what uh, all of them do, but broadly the general ones are probably the ones you'll use most, or the animation ones. Uh, the scripting ones are for people that are uh, way more intelligent than I am, uh, and then the asset browser ones are maybe a little bit further along uh, down the line when you've, you've made your own assets and you want to swap them in and out of different files. So uh, I like to um, set up the shader editor. So the shader editor is essentially a different representation of the material editor or the shader editor over on the right hand side that probably a few people are quite comfortable with and you can see it's exactly the same so you know over here principal bsdf that's essentially just blender's title for um, the main sort of material node um, and then there's all the options down here you know roughness you know transmission and transparency emission and all those sorts of things are essentially here as well in the node editor so again, you don't have to follow along exactly with how I maybe use the materials down in the node editor. This is just how I like to do it. You can definitely do it over here on the right hand side for a little bit, maybe before we start getting into some of the advanced stuff. So I've got my um, got my backdrop ramp. I've created a new material. In this, this case, it's called material one. We can give it a name, you know, backdrop material. Always good to name things as you go along so you sort of don't get confused once you start having multiple materials through here. Um, and then I'm just going to change the base color a little bit. So I'm going to go for a sort of a green because my character is sort of green. I'm going to go for a sort of maybe a darker green, but sort of a, a tonal background based on my character's sort of coat and trousers, something along those lines. And down here, I'll just increase the roughness a little bit so um, it's not so uh, reflective. So now I've got that uh, material set up on the on the backdrop ramp itself. I'm in the viewport um, shading or the material preview mode of the viewport shading. And if I just increase the strength of that light, you'll be able to see this in rendered mode a little bit better. You can see it's a sort of dark green color. So now that we've set that up, we're going to set up a camera. So we're just going to set up a really basic camera that uh, looks at our character, looks at the backdrop ramp and frames him sort of nicely. So shift A to add, just under lights is camera. And you see the camera comes in and it's added, you know, where the 3D cursor is, which by default will always be at the origin point in Blender unless you move it yourself. So if you shift and right click, you can move the 3D cursor to wherever you want in the scene. It can be as far away as you, as you like, as close to your character as you like. And wherever you put it, the next time you add an object, so that could be anything, it could be a mesh. So if I add in a cube, it will add it to um, the origin point of the 3D cursor itself. So it's just something to bear in mind. Uh, if you do find this little cursor wandering off and you can't find a material, uh, you can't find a light or you can't find an object that you've added in, it will be wherever your 3D cursor uh, was set. So I'll just delete the cube by pressing X and then delete. So I've got my camera here. And there's a few different ways of positioning cameras. Um, you can kind of do it manually in the viewport. You know, press G to move and move it yourself. Um, you could also come over to the right hand side and look at the uh, object properties itself. So the orange uh, square with the four kind of cross corners. And you can control the X location, you control the Y, the rotation as well, the angle of the camera in any one direction. Um, and this can be kind of useful, but probably the most intuitive way to align a camera is to sort of pose your scene um, as you're going along in the viewport shader itself. So you're kind of like zooming in, you're moving around your character, you're like, oh, you know what, I, I, you know, I quite like this angle. It'd be great if I could just add a camera to this point. Uh, luckily, there is a way to do that. So you have to make sure you have your camera selected. So if you have your camera selected, you can either select it in the viewport itself and it will highlight orange, or um, if you 
can't find it in the viewport because it's not there, you can press the um, little green camera icon in the outliner up here. So if you press that, you won't be able to see it unless I zoom out, but you can see it's activated once I press that button. So this is now the active camera in the scene. I mean, it's helpful because it's the only camera in our scene. If we had more than one, you know, you might get a bit lost at this. Um, once we have it as the active camera, we can go to view up here in the top, top left. We can go down to align view, which is just under halfway. And there's a bunch of different options, but one of the options is align the active camera to the view. You, there's also a shortcut for it. Um, which is Control Alt and then the number pad zero. Uh, I just don't have a number pad on my keyboard, um, so I can't actually hit that even if I tried. Um, but align view, align active camera to view, and that will snap your camera to the view that you have in your viewport. And then we can move around, and you'll see it's taken up its new position, and it's all good. If we want to go back to our um, the view as seen through the camera, we can either press the, um, I think I think it's the zero key again on the number pad, but don't quote me on this. Uh, but if you don't have a number pad like me, you can go over here on the right hand side and there's a bunch of different tools. And you can press um, this one here with the little camera icon and toggle the camera view, and that will set you back in. Sazzy just confirming uh, that it's definitely zero on the number pad for those of you lucky enough to have a full side keyboard. Um, so once we're back in here, this is great, but you know, what if we want to change our camera view slightly? Well, luckily, again, we could do that in a number of different ways. We could go over here to our object our properties tab. We could control it through here, so X or Y or Z, or the rotation of any of those things, and that's totally fine. Uh, that's a totally easy way of doing it. We could also do it a slightly different way. So if you press N, N for, I don't know, Nevada, is it? I don't, I'm not sure what the uh, I'm not sure what the right word is for that one. But N for Nevada, it will bring up uh, essentially a little little toolbar over here on the right hand side, and it will have a bunch of options in here. You'll probably see um, a few additional ones here that I have from some various add-ons like for Mixamo and Bendikit and all that sort of stuff. You may or may not have those, but you will definitely have item, tool, and view, and these will present kind of different options to you. So. Within the view tab for cameras specifically, if you expand the view section, these may not be expanded for you, but if you expand the view section, you can tick this one here. If I drag this out, you can read the whole, the whole name, but camera to view. And if you tick that, you'll notice that the camera goes um, in the viewport, it has a little dotted line around it. And this means whatever movement you make um, in your viewport with your mouse will be reflected in the position of the camera itself. If I zoom out, you see the camera starts moving with me. If I rotate the image, the camera starts moving with me, and all sorts. If I press shift and move it along, again, the, the camera starts moving uh, with me. So let's just say, um, you know, I want to pose my character, and I, you know, I'm happy with this kind of angle. I'm happy with, you know, where he's looking. You know, I like the look of the camera, and I'm happy with that. Just press N again, and untick camera to view, and then any movements you make from there on out won't be affected, uh, won't affect your camera, sorry. So I go back into the camera view now, and I'm pretty happy with this, um, although you can see from the bounds of my camera that my backdrop ramp isn't large enough, or uh, isn't rotated enough so that it fills out the whole uh, screen. So I'm just gonna press R to rotate, and then I'm gonna press Z, to lock it in the z-axis so it will rotate around a sort of vertical axis. And I'm just going to rotate it slightly uh, so you can see that my backdrop ramp covers the whole background of the camera. And if I zoom out, you can see uh, now that my ramp is at a slight angle compared to the default world or origins. Um, so now we've kind of set up our camera, there's a few neat things we can do within the camera settings themselves. So I'm into my active camera. If I click on the active camera, you'll know it's active when the, um, the camera in the viewport shades orange. If we go down here to the little camera icon, which is the sort of data icon for the camera itself, uh, you'll see a bunch of things. You'll obviously see the name. You can change the focal length of the camera for those of you that 
you know, um, maybe you are in into photography, you can set some real world settings here. Um, you can also do a bunch of other things. So you can set depth of field. So depth of field being, you know, things in the foreground or the background blurring out of focus if and when you need them to. You can pick your focus object. So you could pick your character and blur the background out, for example. Whatever you might, whatever you might want. The f-stop will essentially control the amount of blur. Uh, I'm not hugely into cameras myself, but I do know that the lower the value, the blurrier it gets, and the higher the value, the less blur it gets. Uh, some of you guys that uh, maybe know more about photography can probably chime in on that one in the chat. But uh, down here, also, just above depth of field, you've got viewport display. So in viewport display, there's a bunch of other things that um, we won't pay attention to maybe in this tutorial, but you've got this option down here, I have absolutely no idea how to say this properly, um, but if you mess with this value, essentially it will darken anything that is outside of the views of your camera. So if I turn it all the way up to one, you'll see that it's completely black outside of the framing of my camera. This is super helpful if you want to just have a, you may also hear the police in the background, um, depending on uh, what crime is going on in London at the moment. But if you push this all the way to one, it will darken, um, it will darken um, anything outside the views of the camera. This is great if you just want a really clean and easy look at the composition and the framing of your, of your camera itself. So sometimes I set this to quite a dark value. So I can kind of still see you know, other things that might be in the scene, um, but you know, I'm remaining kind of focused on the, on the character in the middle there. And just under that option there in the uh, right right hand side i am i'm not living in the hood uh me but you know crime doesn't sleep in london um but i do live on a main road and i do get a lot of sirens so sorry if you can hear those things in the background um but just underneath that option there is composition guide so these are super helpful if you're sort of new to composition and and just want a little bit of help you can select a bunch of boxes here so you can select thirds um and you may or may not just be able to see some really faint lines. It's my, slightly easier if I go back to my um, solid mode in my viewport shader, but you can see some faint dotted lines there, which will help you kind of assess, you know, um, different compositional ratios in your camera. So thirds, center being another one. So if you want to align something dead center, you know, you can now do that if you're in your active camera, it will show you exactly where the center point is and you can align your, your character or you know whatever's, whatever's in your scene about those guides. Um, you know, composition is a sort of own thing in and of itself and it's a little bit subjective, you know, everyone has personal tastes and also depending on the type of content you want to create, you know, if you want to put something into Instagram and you want a square format or, or, or whatever or you want a tall format, you might be better off going with sort of centrally aligned content. If you want to do maybe, um, you know, slightly more cinematic or filmic looking scenes, you might want a slightly um, sort of wider ratio. You know, you may even want to, um, you may even want to change the resolution over here to be even wider, you know, all the way over to like two by one maybe, and then you'll go for ultra cinematic. Doesn't particularly work so great on uh, on Instagram and things like that, but great for a little cinematic feel and, and, and all of those sorts of things. But you know, broadly, if you have a composition that's maybe longer than it is tall, you probably want to align your sort of focal points on any one of the crosses here. So any one of the thirds or slightly off it or slightly under it, it doesn't really matter too much. So I'm just going to go over and align my camera. So my guy is sort of looking almost directly on this little cross point here. So I'll do that by pressing N, take camera to view, I'll press shift middle mouse button just so I'm sliding my camera left to right and I'll just align him over onto the that sort of right hand third as it were and then I'll untick camera to view press N to hide the menu and we're good. So hopefully those are just some little like handy tips and tricks for uh, camera composition and things. Uh, maybe it's a little bit clearer to see what the this option does in the viewport uh, material shading setting but you can see all the way to one darkens it completely, all the way to zero, it's almost like there is nothing. Um, by default, I think it's set to 0.5, 
Um, so you'll notice that things um, are slightly darker when you're in your active camera view, but I like to have it slightly higher. Uh, it just makes it slightly easier to see what's going on uh, within the frame itself. So I think we're at the point where, you know, maybe it's good to start setting up some, some different types of light. At the moment, we've still got our uh, one point light in the scene. So up here in the, in the top right hand side, we've got a point light. And we're going to change this to a spotlight um, for this specific tutorial. There is no real right or wrong answer. It's mainly down to taste or the type of feeling that you want to create. So if you want to create something that's super moody, you might want you know, um, slightly less lighting, you might, might want slightly uh, more directional lighting, you might want, uh, you know, slightly stronger shadows over one side of your, your character. If you want something that's super bright and airy and joyful and playful, you might want something a little bit more even in terms of a lighting scheme. Um, I know Panda's a huge fan of um, colored lights and having your character be lit from sort of two directions, you know, one side could be neon blue or one side could be neon pink. The freedom is yours to sort of change the feeling of um, change the feeling of your scene, how you want to, um, you know, show, show off your beast or, or show the world that he wants to live in or she wants to live in. So, uh, I've got one point light here. Oh, sorry. One, uh, one spotlight. Um, you know, I could, I could just delete this and start again, you know, shift a light spot that will add one in on my cursor G to move. Z to lock it in the x-axis, that will move it only up and down. And you can see I've got like a really even light coming across my character. If I go into my rendered shading mode, turn up the power of the light, you can see that a little bit more easily. So let's just rotate. So I'll rotate the light, so R to rotate, G to move. And let's give it a bit of an angle. So maybe I want the light to be kind of coming in from the from the right hand side, casting a little bit of light over my character. So R to rotate, G to move, so G and then X will lock it in the X axis, G and then Z will lock it in the Z axis, and then R. You can do the same with R, so you can R then Z will lock it in the Z axis, or R then X will lock it in the X axis. So we'll just position that like so. You know, maybe I don't want my light to be bright white. You know, maybe I want it to be more like um, the evening sun or something along those lines. So I can just select the color of my light. Maybe I'll go slightly warmer, you know, slightly into the yellows, slightly into the reds. Gives it a slightly more, uh, a slightly softer, uh, slightly um, less sort of clinical feel to it. And then Overall, I might just reduce my spot size a little bit. You can see if I reduce my spot size, the light starts going in and over one side of my character's sort of face. So, you know, if I wanted something kind of super dramatic, I might want to just, you know, only light one half of him, um, whatever it might be. But I'm going to settle for something around a sort of 35 degree mark. You know, I'll add a bit of blend or, or some radius to just soften off that light a little bit. And I'll lower the power just a touch. This is great. We've got some general kind of lighting into the scene. If I go back into my uh, active camera view over here, you can see how that's sort of effective thing. So I've got a bit of a light on the right hand side and it's falling off into shadow onto the left hand side. And this is looking kind of fun, but maybe we could do with a bit more drama. So I'm going to add in a second light, so I'm just going to switch back to, it's usually slightly easier to maybe see um, see when you're adding things in or when you're moving things about to be in solid mode over in the right hand side. Um, and then it's obviously much easier or only, um, or can only be seen if you're in rendered mode, the um, what happens when you change the different parameters of your light. But for now, when I'm adding things into my scene, uh, shift A, I'll add in another light. I'll add in a spotlight. Sorry for the bikes in the background. <laughs> and this is my second spotlight. So this one, you know, I'm going to make a slightly uh, narrower beam. And I kind of want it to come in from the right hand side, uh, cut across the character's face, the beast's face, um, and create a bit of 
uh, kind of drama to it. So I've got my spotlight here. I'm going to just reduce the spot size slightly all the way down to it's a sort of narrower beam. I'm going to press G to move somewhere over to the right hand side. And then I'm going to press R to rotate. And I'm going to just rotate it roughly where it looks about right in terms of the cone itself crossing over my character's face. Now, if I go back into uh, rendered view, I just need to turn up the power of that light slightly. So maybe I'll go for somewhere around a thousand. I'll just increase the uh, the blend slightly, or I'll increase the radius. So it's a slightly softer fall off of the light. Maybe I'll reduce the spot size even more and increase the power even more. I'll change the color to something slightly warmer again, so it kind of matches my other light. And right now it's kind of pointing over here. It's kind of meandered a little bit off where my beast is. So I'm just going to R, whilst I've still got that camera select, uh, camera, uh, point light selected, or spotlight selected, sorry. I'm going to press R to rotate, and then Z to lock it in the Z axis, and just rotate it around where it begins to kind of maybe clip my character's face slightly. Maybe I want it even stronger and even narrower. Sometimes it's easier uh, to figure out exactly what the lighting is doing um, back in your camera view. You can see very directly what's happening here, so uh, hopefully you can just about see that. But at the moment, the light is uh, coming in across the right-hand side of the face um, and then falling off in shadow. Maybe I want it even a little bit more powerful. So I'm kind of highlighting across the face there. And maybe I want it to be rotated a little bit less, so I'm kind of capturing a little bit of his body and a little bit of his hand. So if I go back into my camera, you can see I'm casting some sort of light across the sort of upper half of the beast. At the moment, I've only got that second uh, light turned on. If I turn it off, he disappears. And if I turn the other one back on, you can see I kind of lose that dramatic lighting. And this is okay. We can just turn down the power of that light so it affects things less, but you still can maybe um, just about read some of the other detail in the scene. So this is looking pretty good. It's looking pretty dramatic. You know, if I let that just res up um, for a little bit of a second. It's looking all right. Um, but you know, maybe we can make it a little bit better. Maybe we can add a bit of fog in there. Maybe we can get the uh, light beam to kind of look like a beam. Um, you know, the world is our sort of oyster in this. So this should still work in, in Eevee, um, I believe. But at the moment, as I say, I'm in cycles. But if I shift A and add a mesh and add a cube, just flip back into material preview mode. I've got a cube in my scene. Uh, it's not doing a huge amount at the moment. Um, if I scale the cube up so it engulfs the whole scene, or most of the scene, um, this is going to be our sort of like our fog box, I guess you could call it, or our sort of volumetric fog box. So I'll just name the cube, I'll name it fog, you know, I can name my plane, you know, backdrop, backdrop ramp. It's always good to just keep things, keep giving things a name as you go along. So this is great, and let's add some volumetrics to it. So uh, you can again do this over in the material view on the right hand side. So you can add a new material in here and go from here. Or again, as you can see, see in the bottom of my screen here, you can uh, use the material uh, node editor itself. So if you're following with me along in the node editor now, we can delete the principal BSDF. We don't need this at the moment. So we press X and that will be gone. Now this thing uh, sort of has material, but it has nothing driving the properties of the material. And all the same shortcuts that you use up in the viewport will also work down in the node editor. So, you know, shift and middle mouse button to sort of drag, you know, G 
we'll, we'll move these guys, you know, once you select them around, move these nodes around, all that sort of good stuff. And Shift A to add also works. So if you press Shift A, press search, and type in whatever you want. So in this case, we want volume. And there's a few different options, but the one we want is principled volume. So this is where we're starting to sort of enter into maybe some of the more uh, intermediate things. Uh, but hopefully it's still simple enough that if you've never used the, the node editor before, you should still be able to follow along. But the principal volume, and plug the volume over here into the volume here. Now if I go back into my rendered mode, you'll kind of see that it just looks like a back box at the moment. And that's because the density is too high. So we've got a density of 1, a density of... Um, A density of zero would uh, be completely sort of transparent, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. And maybe we want something slightly higher. You'll have to use um, this will kind of change depending on the size of your cube, the sort of uh, lights you've got in your scene, uh, and so on and so forth. But usually, some sort of low value in and around the 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.2 mark will probably work quite well. So if we go 0.1 you begin to see a few things happening. Um, and the value underneath this uh, is an interesting one. So I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but uh, the anisotropy, <laughs> anisotropy uh, value, uh, I don't exactly know what it does, but you can kind of think of it maybe as contrast. So if you turn it up, um, the light beam will kind of have more effect relative to the sort of darkness and contrast of the rest of the scene. So at the moment, not a lot is, uh, not a lot is happening. Um, and that's probably because our spotlights just aren't quite strong enough for the um, fog, uh, the fog itself. So we just turn up the power of our spotlights slightly to get this to be a little bit clearer. Um, and you have to just be a little bit experimental about the the power of your lights at these points. Um, again, it will kind of change depending on your on your scene and things like that. So if I go back into my camera view, you can start to see that I'm getting a little bit of fog, a little bit of fog action going on. I'm just going to check to see if it's all still um, working in EV. Still looks like it's just about working in EV as well back into cycles I just lost my bearings there for a second <laughs> so I just increase the spot size slightly of the one that's going left to right across the scene Maybe I'll drop the radius slightly, so it's a little bit more of a defined uh, area. You know, you can kind of have some fun here and, and play along with things as you, you know, as you start experimenting with your scene and your specific scene and character and and the setup you've got within it. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we have. Um, is there a time limit on this uh, on this tutorial? I know we're sort of coming up to the hour mark here, and I, I don't want to uh, take up no, man, keep loads, going. loads of people's time. Um, keep rocking. This is recorded. If people got to go, they can drop out and watch it later. But yeah, man, keep going. All right. So we'll just we will keep going with some things, but you know, broadly. Um, maybe we'll dip into some slightly more advanced things in terms of, um, you know, using the uh, node editor with lights. So in the same way that you can use the node editor with uh, objects and materials, you can also use the node editor um, with lights, or at least specifically in cycles. So this might be the bit where, um, you know, those of you that are using Eevee, um, probably can't replicate 
exactly what I'm about to do. Um, there might be ways around it, but I didn't quite find one in my experiments. I think it's partly to do with the way that EV calculates light differently to, uh, to cycles, but um, for example, so if we we'll just hide, we'll just unhide that second light, and we'll just temporarily hide our volumetric cube just so it's a little bit easier to see see what's going on. Uh, on the screen, but and we'll use this um, slightly bigger, slightly softer light, maybe um, for this next part. So I'll just move it in slightly closer. Maybe I'll move it into the background, so I'm sort of illuminating the background a little bit more in my render. So at the moment, I've got this one light casting light in a cone to the background. Now we can start doing all sorts of fun things with this light. Um, you know, beyond just changing power, beyond changing color. So once you're in the node ed editor, so I've got mine here at the bottom. Uh, if you don't have that, you can drag up a window from the bottom with the crosshairs and then just select the shader editor or shift F3 to select that and go into it. And just next to that, you'll have a couple of different options. So you'll have object, uh, world uh, and line style. So you can also control your world. This is maybe something I, I forgot to mention, but you can also control your world scene settings um, within the node editor itself. So rather than using the world properties over here, um, you can control it within the node editor itself. So if I just delete that, you can see that I've got my color and the background back again. Maybe I'll just set that to a little bit of a, a, a kind of dark gray, just so I can kind of see my character a little bit better. You can control the strength and all sorts of things like here. So you can do a lot of crazy things in here if you really want to, you know, create all sorts of custom uh, sort of sky textures and day and night cycles and things like that. But we won't go into those um, in this tutorial. But uh, if we go back to object, because we're going to pick an object and we pick our light. So we pick this big soft diffuse light and right over here, you know, you've got view, select, add, node, and a little blank checkbox, um, which if you tick, use nodes, it will enable us to use the material node editor for the lights. So it's essentially moving all the controls that are within the lights over here on the right hand side into the node editor. And you can start to do some fun things. So, you know, we could, um, you know, start to control the color in here if we wanted to. We can control the, uh, the strength in here if we wanted to. Anything that you do within this node editor is essentially multiplied on top of anything that's already kind of set over here in your light properties. So for example, if I had a, if I had a red light over in my, um, in my properties on the right hand side, and then over here I added in a blue light, it would mix the two together. Or if I added like a green light, it would again mix the two together and the light color would be yellow in this case. So I'll just undo a couple of those things, go back to my kind of neutral light. And then obviously at the moment I'm adding in essentially pure white light onto that. And you can just leave the strength at one if you don't want it to be uh, changed beyond the default settings. So once we're in this mode, we can do a couple of things. So um, those of you that have like made some materials will probably be most familiar with this, but um, we can add anything into this. So we can add textures, we can add images, we can add whatever it might be into the node editor, connect a few things together, and it will change what happens in the viewport rendering. So Shift-A will add in the same way that Shift-A adds in the viewport editor. Shift-A to add. It's a different menu. There's a different, you know, different things you can add in here. And if we... Um, if we press uh, search and we go for a noise texture, so it starts typing noise texture, it will bring in this orange looking node, which is a noise texture. And we can connect this noise texture um, to our light and make the noise texture kind of influence the light in some ways. But in order to do that, we'll need to 
tell the noise texture where to go. So where to position itself on the light itself. And in to do, uh, to do that, we'll need to add a couple of more nodes. So right click, uh, sorry, shift A, search and a mapping node. That'll be this purple node. Shift A to search and add a texture coordinate node. That'll be this pink thing. And those are all the things that we need to tell the texture where to go. We've not linked anything yet, so nothing is changing up here in the uh, rendered viewport, but we will link some things uh, along the line. So uh, broadly speaking, if you've never entered into this uh, node editor much before, you know, yellow things kind of go to yellow things, uh, gray things will usually tend to go to gray things, though not always. Uh, purple things will kind of go to purple things. Um, although again, uh, not always, um, but broadly that's kind of like um, the easy way to tell if you're trying to plug something into the wrong um, socket. So at the moment we will just plug the color of the noise texture. So noise textures are black and white by default, like any texture that you add in, or most textures that you add in Blender will be black and white in some description or another. Um, noise textures are kind of that noisy, blurry sort of texture that you might use for displacement maps or whatever it might be. Uh, Voronoi's are kind of a little bit more pixelated and things like that. There's a number of different options. Um, you can also add in your own textures and image maps, black and white image maps, whatever you feel like. But if we plug the color into the strength, this will tell Blender to change the strength, so how bright or not the light is, based on the color so the black and white values in the noise texture. Um, so then afterwards we need to tell Blender um, you know, where this noise texture should be positioned on this light. So we'll add in the mapping node, we'll plug the vector of the mapping node, the purple one, into the vector, the purple one of the noise texture, and then we'll plug the over here in the texture coordinates. So this is the thing that actually tells Blender exactly where the texture should be going. There's a bunch of different options and we won't dive into them uh, this time around, but if we pick the normal, put it into vector, we should be ready to start making some changes. So I will just temporarily increase the power of my light. It might be slightly easier to see with a slightly brighter light in the viewport editor. So it doesn't look like much is happening. Um, and that's because the scale of our um, noise texture is a little bit too big. You can kind of see some stuff happening there if I uh, move the scale left to right. Um, but at the moment, not a huge amount is happening. And that's because most of the values in the noise texture are sort of gray or near gray. So um, we want to add some contrast to this noise texture that will help um, us break up this light a little bit more. And we can do that through using a color ramp. So if we shift A to add search and then a color ramp, it will give you this thing. You can then just click, you can drag it over to where you need, um, drag it over to any of these lines and they'll, hide, they'll begin to highlight. Uh, hopefully you can see that underneath where your mouse is. And we want to plug the ability to control the contrast, so the difference between the black and white values of the noise texture, um, between the noise texture and the light itself. So right here, so we'll plug the color ramp in there. Um, and we begin, we can begin to control the texture, so the contrast of the noise texture itself, by sort of crunching these two values together. So white and black and moving them together. And you'll start to see that the light is no longer a pure circle. It's a few um, sort of blobs. And our scale at the moment is still quite big. You know, if we go back to one, which is the default, it's even bigger. The further you go up, the smaller the texture will be. Um, I think I'm going to set it maybe around, I don't know, let's just say 15 for now. And we'll crunch these values in a little bit more, so you get a little bit more contrast between the dark and white points. And what this will do, you can also play around with some of these other settings, though it might not be super evident um, in terms of what we're using this for, but the if I lower the radius slightly, so you begin to see exactly what that texture was doing. 
So if I remove this color ramp, just plug my color back into the strength, you can kind of see the noise texture being applied to the light, um, but it doesn't look particularly great because most of the values are kind of varying shades of gray. This is what the color ramp is for. It just increases the contrast of the noise texture itself. So again, reconnect the color to the strength and you can see all the black areas are black and then the, the white areas are light. So if I just increase the radius a little bit more, you can see we get this nice sort of dappled, um, you know, a few, a few dappled sort of effects. This is great, um, you know, if you've seen any of my kind of videos, like this is great for uh, things like trees and leaves. Like if you want to have the illusion of light rolling through leaves or trees or canopies, um, you know, without necessarily modeling in or having loads of things in your scene that slows your computer down, this is a great way to sort of fake it. Um, so I'm a little bit conscious of, of time. I don't want to kind of run too long into things that, um, uh, yeah, lost. Either. We got about, uh, like five, 10 minutes left just to give you an idea. I think maybe we just, we could, um, we could just wrap it up a little bit here and maybe have a bit of a Q and a, but because I don't, I don't want to dwell into things that maybe, you know, 50% of, uh, you know, the guys that are using EV, uh, maybe can't do, uh, just yet. Perfect. Um, can you, uh, can you render the image so we can see what the final one looks like? Yeah, uh, definitely try. And and for anyone in the chat, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the chat now. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, this whole session, along with the previous seven sessions we've done, are all recorded. They're all in the Beast Blender YouTube playlist, which can be found on a shop called beast.com. If you haven't already, make sure you go bookmark that site. It's got step-by-step -step instructions if you're brand new of how to install. Um, a lot of great resources that will make creating renders very, very easy. Um, and also these tutorials. I'll just render it out now. I've still got my, um, still got the fog in the scene. So you can see some of the volumetrics kind of happening there as we render out uh, the image properly. Yeah, this looks like so clean. Thank you again for showing it. I mean, I got so many awesome new tips out of this and it's just going to help. Uh, this is uh, one area we definitely needed a tutorial in because it's not something we've really touched too much. Um, and it's awesome that it's, you know, more towards the beginner side as well. So hopefully everyone got um, some great information out of this. I'm not seeing any questions. So last, last chance, questions or comments for Lost before we wrap up. Yeah, if you've got... Lost, did you have anything else before we finish? Sorry. Oh, uh, no, nothing else for me. I just, if people do have questions, you know, just drop me a DM. Um, I'll try and answer them. You know, if you don't want to ask them in the chat um, or you just, maybe you come across the tutorial uh, in your own time and you have some questions on it. Uh, yeah, just ping me a message. I'll try and answer them. Yep. And then we also do have uh, a couple Blender channels as well. Um, so you can post questions in there. Um, you know, all the guys that have, you know, done it previously, myself, Panda, Sazzy, you know, just tag us in Discord if you have any questions going through our tutorials, um, and we can definitely help you out with that. But yeah, if there's nothing else, let's go ahead and drop some emojis and some gifts in the chat to thank Lost for taking his time to do this. This is really going to help take uh, a lot of the Beast content to the next level and just make it look super clean and super dope. So thank you again to Lost. Really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great day. Yeah, thank you for joining, guys. Um, yeah, hit me up with any questions if you've got them. I'll try and answer them. <clears throat> Yo, Last, this was amazing. I appreciate you coming up. I've learned a lot. I'm going to start doing some cool lighting, too, now because of you. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, and Lost, can you send me the... Actually, I'll, I'll just, I'll just um, connect with you on the back end. <laughs> sure.